One presents Based on a Live action comic book feature films were just not prevalent in the 70s and 80s. Moving past those early serials that ran back in the 40s, there were just basically television shows in the 70s like The Incredible Hulk and Wonder Woman, and TV movies like Doctor Strange and Captain America. The Batman 66 television show proved popular enough to release a feature film based on the series, but that theatrical film did not light the box office on fire. It wasn't until Richard Donner's Superman proved to be a massive success for Warner Brothers in 1978 that would finally kick off the superhero genre of films, though superhero films would remain in its infancy for nearly 10 years. Michael Uslan had collected comics since he was a kid, a lifelong comic book fan who had recently graduated law school, written comic books for DC like The Shadow, and was learning the ropes of the movie business out in Los Angeles. Eustlin's producing partner was no industry freshman. Benjamin Melnicker had begun his career at MGM back in 1939, and by the time he left MGM as the executive VP and chairman of the Film Selection Committee, he had greenlit some of the biggest films in cinematic history, including Dr. Zhivago, Ben-Hur, and 2001 A Space Odyssey. Now partnered together, there was only one DC character that Uslan and Melnicker wanted to see on the big screen, and that character was... Batman. Producer and executive producer of films like Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight Trilogy, Constantine, and Justice League. Swamp Thing producer, Michael Uslan. We had just finished negotiating the deal and signing the deal and paying the money to acquire Batman. And I realized very quickly that to get that up and running, it's going to take as many as two to three years. Had I had any clue at that moment that it would wind up taking 10 years to get the first movie made, uh, I don't know what I would have done, but the George Washington Bridge would have looked sweet. So I needed something that we could do quickly. So I went back to... Saul Harrison and Carmine Infantino at DC, and I said, I want to buy the rights to Swamp Thing. They said, great, um, you know, keep it going. Uh, but, you know, we, we don't handle the negotiations anymore. They're handled by Warner Publishing. So you got to go back to them to, uh, to do this. This was circa 1979, 1980. And the people who generally were running the movie business were people who were already adults in the 1950s when comic books came under attack and were blamed for being the primary, if not the sole cause, of the post-World War II rise of juvenile delinquency in America. Mostly all of the people I was dealing with at that time had really no respect for the comic book industry, for the creators, for the characters. I was told point blank straight from the horse's mouth that the only reason Warner Communications bought DC Comics was to get the rights to Superman because they believed, as did people generally in the business at the time, that only Superman had the ability to be transformed into a big-budget blockbuster movie and that there was nothing else of value in DC's library and certainly not in Marvel's library. We went back and I said to the Warner Publishing folks, I want to now buy the rights to Swamp Thing. And he looked at me and his jaw dropped and he said, Swamp Thing? Are you telling me DC publishes a comic book with a stupid name like Swamp Thing? And I said, well, it's not so stupid. I said, it's actually won the equivalent of Comic Books Academy Awards. And he goes, let me check this out. He made some calls. He comes back and he goes, well, we used to publish this, but DC doesn't publish it anymore. He goes, it just sounds so stupid. <laughs> So uh, I said, well, if we make this movie deal, then DC will bring this back. It'll blow dust off of an asset that's just gathering dust in the library and will create revenue again. And he said, there's no way we're ever bringing back Swamp Thing. He said, it's worthless. And at that moment, I said, you know, you're right. It is worthless. So why don't you give it to us for free? If you give it to us for free, 
we will commit in writing to spend no less than $15,000 of our own money to develop the asset to get this thing underway. So he gave it to us for free. And in the contract, it said that we had the rights to all characters and stories appearing in the pages of Swamp Thing and uh, heretofore or hereafter appearing in the pages of Swamp Thing. So as a result of that, we automatically became the owners of Constantine. And I believe the last total was 11 different characters who had been introduced in Swamp Thing. With the rights of both Batman and Swamp Thing now secured, the race was on to bring both characters to the big screen. In this respect, Swamp Thing was the big winner, as even though Batman was announced in 1980 with a $15 million budget and Peter Goober and John Peters attached to produce, that film would take many years to reach the big screen. But Swamp Thing was already years ahead in terms of production, with an established hard director on board to both write and direct the film. Swamp Thing producer, Michael Gusland. Now, I already knew that if I got the rights, I had Wes Craven on board to write and direct this thing. Having been a motion picture production attorney for United Artists at this time, I knew that United Artists International Department had made tons of money with Wes's movie, The Hills Have Eyes, and they were eager to be in business with Wes in international territories. At the same time, my partner, Ben Melniger, uh, called his old buddy Bob Rainey, who at that time was the president of Avco Embassy Films, which had done movies like The Graduate. Bob said, my God, you know, we love Wes Craven. If you can get Wes Craven, we would put up half of any budget and take domestic rights. I had a chance to talk creatively with Wes and get him excited. Wes was looking to branch out and not simply do straight horror. Totally got him into this thing and showed him the original 10 or 11 Swamp Thing stories by Bernie and Len. He loved them. His agent at the time was an old school Hollywood agent, Marvin Moss, who was an old friend of Ben's. We wound up having lunch together, the four of us, at Musso and Frank's Grill on Hollywood Boulevard, which is the oldest old Hollywood restaurant still intact from 1919. You know, where Marilyn Monroe and Humphrey Bogart, you name it, they were regulars there. And we were sitting there, and Ben and Marvin wound up writing down on a napkin at Musso and Frank's the different deal terms. And then at the end of that lunch, we all signed the napkin. And that's how we got Wes. Thanks for watching this latest chapter of Based on His Look at Swamp Thing. And please like, subscribe, and comment if you're enjoying the series. We'll return shortly with Chapter 3 and very special guests, stars Adrian Barbeau and Reggie Batts, producer Michael Uslan, and first assistant director Todd Corman.